morning friends. It's Steve from Southern Illinois. Another nice spring day. Spring has lasted a long time this year down here. <clears throat> we had a cold snap in the middle of the week uh, down into the 20s. But even that couldn't slow spring down. The red buds are starting to blush. The crab apples are painting the woods with white. Um, it's a beautiful time. So I'm sorry for those of you up in Minnesota who had snow this week, but you know, spring will get there before Christmas, I promise. Last week I talked to you, told you the story of the fly that led me to the realization of how disrespectful I was being of God. Who I wasn't even sure I was real, and yet the thought of the magnitude of my disrespect that I was showing to this hypothetical being made me uncomfortable because even hypothetically that was not who I wanted to be. So I prayed a dangerous prayer, and I told God that his mercy and his grace, the good things that had been in my life, the privileges that I had, had not brought me to repentance. I had not surrendered my life to him. So I asked him to do whatever it took to save me. The next five years of my life went from good, to difficult, to horrible, to worse than horrible. And life fell apart. It fell apart at work, it fell apart at home, it fell apart emotionally. That was when uh, I found myself down in the deepest pit of, de of de depression that I had experienced and was suicidal. I was a wreck, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. But through all of this, I continued going to church. <clears throat> you see, that experience with the fly had made me realize that I didn't want to disrespect God. <laughs> I have a, a friend who talks to me regularly on the phone. One week he's a Christian, the next week he's a pagan, the next week he's something else. He's, he's all over the place. It's kind of, kind of a shock and awe conversation every time spiritually. And recently he's been an atheist and telling me that he doesn't believe in God. And yet, yet even he, this week, told me, you know, I don't think it's good to um, dare God to do something bad to you. Well, I was determined to keep going to church, and I did. And I didn't just go to church. I actively did church. I participated in the music. I taught children's class. I taught adult Bible class. I preached on Sabbath. I still wasn't sure I could trust the Bible or trust Christianity, but I knew that I wanted to go down this pathway. I just, I just had trouble believing. And I leaked questions, okay? I, I leaked change. I introduced guitars into the music ministry. Oh, that was controversial. Yes, yes. Uh, I asked questions that made people uncomfortable. But I was so active in church. And besides, I was a doctor. People just wrote my questions off to my education. Uh, he uses college words, you know. And uh, tension gradually increased in me, if not in the church. People just wrote me off as too intellectual and laughed or cried or fumed. I was difficult, you see. The crisis came one Sabbath morning. Yes, I was back in a Sabbath-keeping church. 
the crisis crisis came on a Sabbath morning and that particular morning I was supposed to be the Sabbath school superintendent you know the one who keeps everything moving watches the clock tells people okay now it's time to move on to this part of the program but at the beginning I was supposed to give these let's use a college word cogent thoughts these meaningful thoughts to kind of set the tone for the morning and I was prepared oh I was prepared the theme for that day's study was something I was really invested in and boy was I going to make people think with my thoughts but as I got up in front of the church and I was at the pulpit and I was smoothing out my paper to make sure that I had everything ready to go all of a sudden I realized you know Steve it doesn't matter what you say this morning your hearts empty you've wrapped that emptiness with all of this activity all of these questions all of this doing all of this appearance of being a Christian but at the core of it you know it's empty you don't believe you don't trust you don't have a relationship with the God you hope you wish was real and this all washed over me and it was devastating I'm standing up there in front of the church and all of a sudden they can see that something's wrong I've got all of their attention now okay and tears start running down my face and I can't stop them and I, I, I try to, to speak but nothing comes out and I'm getting more and more choked up and finally an elderly man in the, the congregation says well just spit it out sonny and so I did between sobs I just blurted out friends I'm I'm emotionally and spiritually bankrupt Please don't listen to a word I have to say because I'm dangerous. And don't ask me to do anything in church anymore, okay? Uh, if you let me continue to participate in the, the, the music, let me play the piano, I would love it. But don't ask anything more of me because I am bankrupt and it's dangerous to listen to me. And I'm, I'm sobbing now uncontrollably. And, and, you know, everybody's eyes are just like saucers. This was not what they expected. And the elderly man who told me to spit it out is like, I didn't mean that. Okay? I mean, who says that kind of stuff in church? Up front. But when I, I asked if they would let me continue to play the piano, uh, some people kind of hesitantly nodded their heads and so there was nothing more I could do I couldn't talk anymore I was sobbing too much so I went down to the piano and I sat down on the piano bench and I started playing what a friend we have in Jesus one of my own arrangements of it and it was a it was a prayer it was a plea it was a cry to God for help to be my friend and all of a sudden I felt somebody sit down on the bench next to me and I looked over and it was Luella Luella was one of the older mothers in Israel Luella had been a Christian for a long time Luella and I were like oil and water you see she was one of those, whoa, when I came into the church 50 years ago, this is the way we did it, and I don't see any reason why we should change the way things are done. And I was like, this isn't working. This isn't reaching the young people. This doesn't speak to my heart. We've got to try something new. We've got to try something different. Let's change things up. We had been butting heads like crazy for months, if not years. We didn't hate each other. We just couldn't see eye to eye. And there she was sitting next to me on the piano bench. And I, I'm, tears are running down my face. I could barely see her face. I couldn't see the piano. I was just playing from my heart. 
and all of a sudden she puts her arm around me and she pulls me close and she holds me in her arms while I sob and play what a friend we have in Jesus. And my friends, that's when the dam broke. You see, I had nothing more to prove. I didn't have to prove that I was smart enough to answer all the questions. I didn't have to prove that I was good enough to live the Christian life. I didn't have to prove anything. Everything had been stripped away from me. My emptiness, my shattered life was just visible to everybody who was close to me. And yet, I was loved. Luella's arms became the arms of God holding me, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was safe in his love as well as in the love of my church. Last week, I read a quote to you from a Christian commentator who said, see where is it so I can uh, yeah I'll just have to say, say it from uh, my memory Christianity does not start by answering all of the intellectual questions it starts by answering the longings of the heart you know we as Christians we really need to learn that that's a truth that I know by experience. I am not a Christian today because, because I have answers for all the intellectual questions. I confused my son tremendously because I always emphasized that faith is a choice. It's not dictated by evidence. It's always a choice. And that choice is as much or more a choice to accept the possibility of God, the possibility of His love, and to hold on to that rope and swing out on it and test it. So here's what happened in my life after that moment. Somebody ran and got Vivian. Okay. She was work she was teaching a children's class that day and what do you do when somebody breaks down bawling uncontrollably in church? Because that's still where Steve was at. He was just totally he'd lost it. Well I was sitting there at the piano bench holding me and finally somebody else stands up and gets the program going because, you know, can't stop just because somebody falls apart. But they went and got Vivian and Vivian came and I felt her arm on her hand on my shoulder and let go of me and Vivian said, Steve, what do you need? And I didn't know what I needed, but she said, How about we go home? And I kind of nodded and she led me out of the sanctuary and out of the church and we got in the car and the kids are like, What's mother what's wrong with daddy, mommy? And Vivian didn't have a clue. Well, she had a clue. She knew I'd been depressed. She knew I was struggling, but she didn't know what was happening right then. But I didn't know what was happening right then because my tears now were not tears of, of, of pain, of sorrow, of sadness, of humiliation like they could have been. They were tears of joy. I, was, I felt so euphoric, so happy in the love that I had discovered. When we got home, I, I, I pulled out my Bible, and for the first time in years, I could read it without arguing with it. I told God, okay, God, let's just put all of these questions and doubts up on a shelf. I'm just going to do whatever you say. And if
if you decide to take a question off the shelf and answer it for me, then that's up to you. I'm not going to wrestle with them anymore. That's your job. But you have one year to prove that you are real. I'm going to go wholeheartedly after you, but you've got one year. And if at the end of the year you haven't proved that you're real, well, then it's been a good experiment. <laughs> yeah, I actually gave God an ultimatum after I surrendered my life to him. And you know what I've discovered? That's exactly what God wants his children to do. He wants us to swing out on that rope. He wants us to test it. Come now, let us reason together, he says to us, and he means it. Did my life suddenly magically turn around? No, not immediately. I was still depressed. Uh, I went to counseling. Had to learn how to take care of my body and my mind and my emotions. Had to learn what it meant to be married all over again. Had to restructure my work. There was a lot that had to happen before I felt better. But I started reading the Bible voraciously, like a starving man. And I went straight to the Gospels and I said, Jesus, I want to know what was so important that you came down here and were willing to risk dying. No, that you came down here and will, willing to die to share it with us. What was the message that you came to give us? And you know, as I read, I re realized it was really simple. Jesus came to say that God was on our side. Has been all along. He's not the enemy. The enemy is the one who wants us to think that God is angry at us. That God's unreasonable. Life didn't turn all up all roses. But that morning in church was the turning point. Are all my questions answered today? No. No, a few have come off the shelf and been resolved, but most of them are sitting up there and I've discovered that most of them really weren't asking, worth asking to begin with. But that's okay because I've learned that trust is not about evidence, it's about a choice. You see, we never can accumulate enough evidence to prove that we can trust someone, God or man. Vivian didn't know she could trust me when she married me. If she had waited to prove that I would always be faithful, always be true, always be reliable, never abandon her, never die on her, we would still be dating 40 odd years later. And yet, how many of us do that with God? Christianity begins not with solving all the intellectual difficulties, but with satisfying the longing of the heart. What are you longing for? Are you willing to risk giving that longing to God? Now, before I close today, okay, I had a really difficult week. You see, COVID is raging through Southern Illinois, despite the fact that the media is downplaying the surge, okay? My doctors and nurses are under severe stress. The hospitals in Evansville are once again full to the gills. Last night alone, we... We had to tell three people that, well, I don't know what we told them because I wasn't there, but looking over the charts, these three people are not going to live through the week. 
and yet middle of the week I was in Walmart and I saw the pharmacist at the door greeting every person who walked in as inviting them to have their COVID shot no requirements no no screening for if you have this condition or you're this age or you have this job everybody come and get your COVID shot I watched him for 20 minutes and not a single person accepted and I said enough's enough and I walked up to him and I said I'm Dr. Scott can I help you he said please and so I started stopping every person at the door and I was saying I'm Dr. Scott I founded Sipka here in town have you had your COVID shot you know I only had 15 minutes to lend him but in that 15 minutes one person said yes I got my second one this week and every other person said no and I'm not getting it I wanted to cry I wanted to weep okay you're throwing every doctor and nurse under the bus by your choice it's your choice and this is a free country and I respect freedom of choice but you need to understand that the consequences of that choice are dire people continue to die we are working overtime we are working short staffed we are watching people die left and right because of your choice and I don't know how to get through to you we love you Healthcare workers love the people they serve. And we don't know how to save you when you won't accept it. <laughs> but I guess I was right in that, that camp, wasn't I? For years with God. He was desperately trying to save me. And I was turning my back on him. Well, this is a little bit tangled and wrapped around and coming back and be safe, my friends. Please be prudent. Please keep looking up. I'm going to need to take a little bit of a break here. Life is getting really, really busy because of COVID. I may not be with you next week, but know this. I'm still thinking about you. I still care about you. see you around.